and I'll say this as we begin our class tonight for Grace Abounds. Welcome everybody as we are in class number five, chapter number four. I'll say today, uh, having to take a little bit more proactive role in VBS this year, and I was, coming into it, I was very concerned about how we would fare hosting VBS because it's been four years. Our church has diminished a little bit with a volunteer corps especially. And I could not have underestimated our church family more. They have responded, you have responded in ways that have been just, I mean, this is as good as I think it's ever been. There's a few loose ends that were not tidied up, which are this guy's fault. But all in all, I mean, registration was a breeze. I sent that email out that at Amber's urging on uh, Friday, and almost everybody that needed to register this morning, we expected to have a little rush at the door, and everybody paid online on our website, which means now we got a whole, like, 40-plus more families that know about how to give on our website, too, if a prospect ever generates into a, a member. So, uh, Steph Granger, a little shout-out to her. She had... Amazing preparation in our classroom. Jen did fantastic in her classroom with the littles and with the scheduling uh, and the management of those things. Ralph helped out tremendously with coordination, getting our, our set crew done and organize, organizing some of our events for the kids. We had a, a, a volunteer friend of uh, Matt Mitchell's who, we got out of the games yesterday but she, uh, she, showed up about, uh, she showed up early and I gave her about 15 minutes because that's how late we were. And within 15 minutes, she and Donna Bassey orchestrated an incredible game uh, array in the sanctuary, which was awesome. Matt Mitchell is the science teacher extraordinaire. He's, he's just amazing with what he knows as a teacher, but he's also amazing with classroom management. He's fun. The kids love him. Uh, it's just, and then I'm, I mean, Silvana, we had an, an amazing amount of teenagers respond, both from our teen group and, of course, the Wisco kids that came. Nicole DeBenin, Christina, my wife, uh, Judy Beal were awesome at the registration thing. It was way less complicated than it's been in the past. Amber Padoti prepared to do all the crafts and to do them well. She got to almost, you know, days away from VBS starting, and then I said, can you do music instead? So she graciously, without getting upset, without getting irritated, handed it all off to Lisa Wiggs, taught Lisa Wiggs how to do it, prepped her, and then Amber went and taught music and did so splendidly as well. I mean, it's just been awesome. The kids had a fun time today. We had great decor, Brad Beal and the crew, just uh, incredible on the crew. And you're watching from home now. It looks like I'm sitting in the front of, a, of a, an amazing castle. Some of the Pedoti kids and some of the high school kids with the moat and everything up here. It's just fun. So, yeah, right. So, it's just, I'm just, uh, I'm all, I'm just proud of our people. Sad about how I underestimated who God has given us to, to serve. And also, just very, very thankful. Just very thankful. Oh, by the way, I haven't even thrown a shout out to, uh, all the people who donated food or meals or hosting the kids uh, in the evening times during the week, and of course, Brenda Campbell, who's letting them stay at her house here in Vegas. So anyway, thank you, and uh, hopefully a beacon of things to come for future years, too. Let's pray as we begin Lesson 5, Chapter 4, the last chapter of Prolegomena, which is essentially an introduction. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for the precious treasure of your holy word. You've given your word to us so that we can have faith, trust in our hearts, and so that through that faith you can channel to our hearts exactly what we need to be saved, to go to heaven, and to live a God-pleasing life. Now may we, in our study of the scriptures, this class tonight, and in everything we think, say, and do as the people of God, Strive for glorifying God's name even more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, apologies to you and to everyone uh, with everything that's going, been going on synodically and as a circuit and as our church with VBS and many other things. I did not get my reading done last week until about, what, Thursday and then I sent out the email Friday-ish, was that right? 
So whenever you get the email, um, oh no, Saturday. I think I sent it to you Saturday. So I apologize for that. I'm about two-thirds of the way done with the reading for next time. So I'll probably email you the, uh, the, f the conclusion to, or I'll, I'll, email, I'll email you the, the chapter five worksheet maybe tomorrow afternoon or early Wednesday, either way. But you'll get it a lot earlier this week because I am way ahead of the game this week compared to last. I think you can tell by the reading, though, not only by its length but by its complexity, that the pastor types, we uh, chew all the meat off the bone, <laughs> right? So he'll say the same thing in three different sentences, and if you really look at it carefully, one paragraph, whether it's short or long, the point that he's trying to make, he will either emphasize it with either further insights, uh, different insights, or different sections of scripture that, oh, I didn't think of that, or whatever. He can belabor a point a little bit, but it's, I think, valuable that he does, because he really doesn't leave many stones unturned. Now, if you did not have a chance to fully finish the worksheet, no sweat, I'll help guide us through the discussion, and I, of course, I understand because of the late hour at which you got this worksheet. But with that said, let's jump into chapter 4, help me as you can, otherwise we'll walk through these things and discuss. For what three reasons has God given us his word? Okay, number one is to bring us to faith. Good. You can't have faith without the word of God. So as we talked about in Sunday morning Bible class yesterday, you should not expect a mystical experience or a, you know, a spiritual bowel movement of any sort which will give you faith. It's simply the word. What's another reason? That's right. So you come to faith, you're take, you're, you're, seat in heaven is guaranteed and the Bible tells you essentially how your life can become a thank you card. And that's the difference between Christian Lutherans and many other Christian denominations like Catholic, Episcopalian, Methodist, Pentecostal, Baptist. We serve not because we have to, not because we're going to ever get closer to holy on this side of planet earth, but or on this side of heaven, but because we're grateful. We want to say thank you to God. Last reason? That's right, to glorify God's name. Uh, Pastor Deutschlander, Professor Deutschlander, <clears throat> used this really funny term called Malchristen, Mal Malchristen, which is a, a German word, and what does it mean? It's a mere mouth Christian, a maul Christian. Did you catch it, Jim? Yeah. It's a hypocrite. Yep. It's a two-faced, duplicitous Christian. You talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk, right? What practical danger and what permanent danger does false doctrine pose to Christian faith? The practical danger is Well, that's, that's the uh, permanent danger. It, it could destroy saving faith because you're insulting God, essentially. But there's a practical danger, or there's a practical danger too. Did you catch that? Okay, failing to live up, yeah. Put it this way. Uh, you want to get healthy, and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in good shape, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat Cheetos all day long, every day, for six days a week out of seven every week. False teaching never does what? It never helps your faith. So, so yes, you can, your faith can survive in churches that have false teaching, but your faith will never thrive as much in churches that have false teaching. Now that sounds crazy because we are consumerist Christians. We're, we're totally Western Hemisphere American Christians, where if the pastor's boring, if the church is sort of stale and ugly and old, we think maybe there's not as much of the Spirit of God here. And we couldn't be further from the truth. 
where the word and sacraments are, where the pure teaching of God's word is, that's where faith is healthiest and fed the best. Again, your faith may not die at a false teaching church, but it will never fully thrive at a false teaching church. So, practical danger, false teaching never strengthens faith. It only weakens it. And the permanent danger is that it could destroy it. Um, let me give you a quick example, especially if you're, if you're watching this online. This is a question I've been getting some of lately. People ask, uh, people are struggling with the idea of uh, why women can't be pastors. And I can dogmatically recite to you all day long the passages that explain why women can't serve as pastors. Even though there are plenty of women on planet Earth who are much more competent and even much more doctrinally grounded and communicatively articulate than some of the pastors that are out there. But because the scriptures say not, of course, we don't do it. But here's the thing I would, I would submit to you. Aside from all the, the formal, systematic, theological, biblical reasons why, have you ever seen a church that has gone the way of allowing female pastors that hasn't gone way off the rails on another doctrinal point of scripture? The point of what I'm saying is, as soon as you give the devil an inch, let's say it's just this little teaching over here or this little teaching over there, soon enough, and we're not even talking a generation, soon enough, everything goes off the rails. Yep, the train goes completely off the tracks. Look, I, I challenge you to look up every Christian church body in America that, has, that allows for, for example, female clergy or for open communion or for loose fellowship practices. You know, we can pray with Hindus, Muslims, Jews. You know, we're all God's children. That kind of thought. And you show me one place where they have given an inch to the devil on those points of doctrine, and I'll show you where they have gone almost completely off the rails with the rest of Scripture. So, creation is another one, by the way. All right, number four. What does false doctrine ultimately say about God? And Jen, I think you were hinting at this before. Yeah, exactly. It makes God out to be a liar. You may not like it. You may not prefer it. It may not be the most comfortable for you. Understand. That's, that's only too human. But we can't suggest that makes something less of God. Otherwise, God would be a liar. Number five, what is the overarching principle we want to keep in mind when interpreting the Bible? This was kind of a, an involved answer, but did you get what he said, Jim? Well, I, I kind of said the theology is a practical Correct. Theology is not this dormant, stagnant, stale thing. It's, a, it's very practical. It's an aptitude. God gave us his word to save us, to show us how to live and for his glory, not for speculation, imagination, philosophy, emotional, or intellectual exercises. In other words, it's not academic. And it's not spurious, like something that is mystical and deep that we have to, like scavengers, figure out. It's practical. It's down to earth. It's meant to be a, a daily practical uh, habit or act, aptitude. By the way, you will get into that a little bit next time. Uh, when you get into chapter 5, you're going to look at the doctrine of God, and I'm Maybe I'm just a little bit biased. I haven't read the rest of the book yet. But I think chapter 5 starts to get a little bit fun. When it comes, I mean, not that it's been boring yet, but chapter 5, when you get into the nature of God, that's kind of like, ooh, ah, yeah. And he really gets into some good stuff about the Trinity and the, uh, the uh, attributes of God. But in that chapter, he very practically and in a down-to-earth way shows how the attributes of God are so gracious. It's almost like where the name of the book comes from. Grace abounds. When you look at God's, for example, the fact that God is a spirit, or when you look at the fact that God is independent, 
or that God is gracious. I mean, all the, the love of God oozes out from his attributes and his nature. So I think you'll really begin to see how practical and awesome it is next chapter too. Number six, what does a proper interpreter of the Bible do? Ralph? Good. Yep. He lets the scriptures speak. Or he or she takes the scriptures on its own terms. Yeah, on its own terms. Well, not necessarily literally, but on its own terms. Because remember, much of the Bible is literal, but he gave some good examples of where it's metaphorical, right? So we take the Bible as it says it wants to be taken. Finish this statement. The most important gifts for the proper study of the scriptures are spiritual gifts. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised he didn't say it. Oh, oh, well, I guess he, he might have said it uh, in so many words. But the number one spiritual gift that you need in order to properly study the scriptures is what? It's not love, although he, he mentioned love and how it binds all these spiritual gifts together. No. Nope. What's the number one? It, it's a very simple answer, but, so don't think too deeply, but what's the number one spiritual gift that you've been given to properly study the scriptures? You got it. It's faith. Because if you read the scriptures without the bias of faith, you're never going to be able to understand it well. Excellent. All right, number eight, list and define. Now, this is, a, this is going to take some discussion here, but list and define the four most basic rules of biblical interpretation. For the sake of those who are watching at home, first, let's just list the short, sweet, succinct sentences, the basic rules, and then we'll explain them. We'll go back and explain them, okay? So what's the number one rule? Good. The, te the text has a single, simple sense. Number two, the scriptures interpret the scriptures. Now, you might have heard me say that before in church, in a sermon, or in Bible study, but that's the number one thing. The Bible interprets itself. Good. The scriptures interpret the scriptures. Number three, Good. Good. Jim said difficult passages should be explained in light of easier passages. So when there's a passage you're reading and it's hard to understand, think about or go, uh, think about or seek out the easier sections that explain it. Uh, in catechism class, we're, when we're, when at the seminary we're taught how to teach catechism class to our youth, we're often encouraged if you have a deep biblical doctrine, to illustrate it or explain it by the use of an Old Testament story or a story from the life of Jesus Christ. Because sometimes uh, harder passages or harder teachings can be well explained by a story. Uh, well, the stories are oftentimes easier to understand, right? That's why we seek them out. Well, in the same way, the easier passages or stories of the Bible can help explain the harder passages. All right, then the last one. Yep, it's called the analogy of faith. And what this means is, it, it, it almost sounds like what I said at the beginning, like you need faith, the best spiritual gift, in order to properly study the Bible. Well, but actually what it means is that we search out all of what the Bible has to say when it comes to that given passage. So now, before I say more about that, let's go back and review the definitions for, or the explanations for each one. The first rule was the text has a single simple sense. That means we take the Bible text as it is. A, pass, a Bible passage is clear as it stands. Jesus does not need our interpretation. We need the author said very candidly, to listen, right? Context will help us take the passage as it is. Every Bible passage is clear, even if it is not clear to us. It's kind of a, sounds like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but God 
didn't give us anything that is by itself unclear or confusing. He gave it to us to be understood. And if we have a shortcoming or a blind spot in understanding it, the flaw is on us, not on the Word of God or the Bible. And when we say we take the Bible text as it is, it refers back to what Ralph and I were talking about earlier, where it says it's history and descriptive and literal. That's the way we take it. Where it says it's a parable and it should be uh, a metaphor for something, then that's the way we take it. If it's a poem illustrating a literal truth or a poem uh, predicting a future event, we take it as such. So we try to take the Bible as it is in its context. Good. That, that's exactly right. Yep. Uh, Jen said we don't add our opinions or our feelings to what it's supposed to mean either. And uh, let's see. I should have probably made a note there. Every Bible passage has one underlying, overarching point. Okay? You wouldn't necessarily always know that by listening to my preaching. Because <laughs> sometimes I look at a, um, a Bible text or a Bible story and I'm like, ooh, I could say this or this or this or this or that. But truly, uh, and in all seriousness, every Bible passage is meant to have one point. Many applications not many interpretations. Okay, the scriptures interpret the scriptures. We've already hinted at this or overlapped with this. The Bible itself pro provides us the correct understanding. Either the narrow or the broad context will help you. And uh, I just made a little note that at times we can only marvel quietly. And I mean that, in other words, sometimes we don't know what it means. Sometimes we just don't know what it means. We still to this day, even with all the Bible passages that teach us about the Trinity, can only marvel at the truth of the Trinity in God's word because we can't fully grasp it. It's just going to always remain a mystery. And when we get to heaven, maybe we'll come to understand it or maybe we won't. Maybe in heaven it'll still be baffling to us how God could be three persons in one God, Right? Difficult passages should be explained in light of easier passages. The Bible is clear, but where needed, the straightforward passages clarify the challenging ones. God's word always explains God's word. If you can remember some of these pithy sayings, keep them in your back pocket. They can be helpful when you're talking to people. Um, you know, somebody says, why, it, it just can't possibly mean that. Well, I appreciate you saying that or, or the thought there, and I can understand why you're saying that maybe. But let's see if the Bible can help us understand itself rather than us giving our own opinions, as Jen said. Um, the author made a big emphasis on if you're trying to understand a passage, a difficult passage in light of an easier one, make sure that you're looking at other passages that are not just simpler but that are directly related to the same topic. Like, don't go look into creation to help you understand uh, eternity. They do have a correlation and maybe even some poetic uh, symmetry, but they're not directly talking about the same thing, are they? Right? So, you want to compare passages that speak about the same topic. And finally, the analogy of faith. We examine all the Bible passages that speak about the same topic. Passages studied in order to formulate Christian doctrine must all address the same thing. Every doctrine must agree with the most fundamental doctrine, salvation by Christ alone through faith. So even the doctrine of Christian fellowship cannot betray the doctrine of salvation by Christ alone. And in that way, when every doctrine is thus formulated, then you will not have a doctrine that betrays Christ, but rather reflects Christ in every way. And that's where he said also in that same context, the application of Bible passages is a never finished product. You're going to, and but, you know this already, but think about, you know, for we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That might mean one thing to you when you're 21 
and you fail a class your senior year of college. It might mean another thing to you when you're 48 and you've been waiting and your family finally has its first child, you know, or has a surprise third child in the case of my oldest brother. Uh, my mother was 42 and she had two little surprises, twins. My twin sisters, Megan and Mara, my mother was 42 years old. In fact, when she came down and told us about it, she told my brother Aaron and me at the table, and she said, well, boys, I have something to tell you. I'm pregnant and with twins. And we kind of looked at each other and said, ha, that's hilarious. Good one, Mom. And she said, no, really. I'm going to have twin sisters even, even now. So anyway, uh, the application of that Bible passage, though, can strike you in any different way depending on your context. The meaning of the passage doesn't change, but the application might change. All right, next page, number nine. What role does human reason play in the interpretation of the Holy Scriptures? Don't say none, because it does play a role. What is it? It's the servant role. Let me ask you this, though, as an application or a discussion question related to this one. Do you use human reason when you read, understand, interpret the Bible? You do. You all agree with that? Are you sure you agree with that? Let's, let's talk about the positives in some aspects. How do you and I use, it's not complicated by the way, how do you and I use human reason when we read and interpret the scriptures? Well, what is happening when you read a word or a sentence or a paragraph? You're using your reason. Your ability to put words together with your eyes and then understand what it means, that's the capacity of reason. Your reason is a gift to you from God. He gives you human reason and human ability to discern and understand as a, as a gift. And so you're using reason whenever you approach the scriptures. You're just not letting your reason trump what the scriptures say and mean when they end up um, Uh, when they end up opposing each other. For example, while one plus one plus one cannot possibly equal one, since my reason cannot grasp that, therefore it must mean something different than it says. Therefore the Jehovah's Witnesses say Jesus is a created being. The Mormons say Jesus is a created being. Reason has trumped scripture and so they've lost Christ. So a servant role, not a master's role. Our church body, or our synod, aims to teach only what the word of God teaches, nothing more, nothing less. What confidence does this give you when you're visiting a Wells church anywhere else? Yep, good. The pastor, the people, the style, the setting, may be very different, right? But the message or the substance will be the same. All right, now we get into we get into the Christian creeds towards the end of the chapter. What three purposes do the Christian creeds and confessions serve? Number 1? Good. Yeah, and be careful about what you write down here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it real precise for you, okay? They summarize for us what we believe, okay? They summarize for us what we believe. So the creeds are for, and the confessions, are for our personal and our church corporate benefit. Then, number two, Good. 
They summarize what we teach in our churches and schools, yep. So, <clears throat> you don't ever want to have a school director or principal or teacher or teacher's aide that will willfully, actively, uh, actively uh, teach anything that betrays not only the scriptures but our confessions. There can be accidental situations. Like you have, let's, let's just say you have a, uh, a 25-year-old staff minister that gets called to, your, to our congregation. He or she is a wonderfully able and active and eager young servant of God in the full-time ministry. But they're sitting at the front of the church giving a children's devotion maybe and accidentally say something that's not perfectly doctrinally pure from the Bible. Does the pastor pounce on them and kick them out of the church immediately? Does he stand up with the microphone and make sure to correct that doctrinal misstatement immediately right in the context of worship? Not necessarily. Depends on the context, how flagrant it was. But if it's accidental, accidents happen with, with, uh, with um, precision of teaching. But it's where people persist in false teaching that we run into risk of danger. That's where we really want to pounce, actually. All right, and then the last one. What third purpose do the Christian creeds and confessions serve? Good, yeah, Sharon said, okay, so whereas, they also, whereas first they summarize for us what we believe, they also summarize for the world what we believe and confess. And I would just submit to you that as the world turns, it might get a little bit trickier that way because we put our confessions right out there. And you can do a little bit of digging and find out just what it is we believe exactly. And there are some little rabbit holes on websites like Reddit that will talk about, you know, the stringency, say, or the uh, fundament, fundament, fundamentalism they'll accuse us of, of what we Wells Lutherans believe. Um, nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be ashamed of, certainly, but just something to be aware of that as the world turns, it might get a little bit more precarious a place for us to have our confessions be so public, but that's what we want them to be. Why doesn't our subscription to the creeds contradict the principle of sola scriptura? Exactly. It's because the only reason we subscribe to them is because they abide by the principle of scripture being the only source of doctrine and because they draw their doctrines from the scriptures alone. They do not draw their teachings from anywhere else. By the way, the confessions, while an invaluable asset for our church body, are, they do not cover every teaching of scripture. They're very, very thorough, very, very sound, very, very uh, long, but you shouldn't imagine that every, every doctrine is treated in there. Okay? In your own words, how could the Apostles' Creed prove valuable to you, provide tremendous support to your Christian witness? Yeah. So, Jen, I asked you to explain to me the doctrine of the Trinity. And you say, well, I can't remember every single Bible passage that says something about the doctrine of the Trinity. But I can say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, the communion of saints. Yeah, and I have said now in three succinct sentences and in like less than 10 seconds what it would take in us maybe a half an hour, maybe longer, to try to find on our phones or in our Bible if we were sitting across from somebody at Applebee's, you know. Besides which, can someone say anything else in their own words? That's the, first of all, simple, sweet, excellent. Anything else? Think about your audience in your Christian witness, not just yourself. It's easy for you to have a simple, sweet tool in your back pocket. But think about your audience. I got a, this is, this is not necessarily a criticism, it's just a reality, okay? I'm, I got a picture here of our volunteers 
are teenagers from outside my office door. You probably can't see it, but they're sitting on the white couch right out there in our lobby. And all three of them in a line are doing what? Can you see? Maybe not. They're on their phones. They're on their phones, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all three of them like clockwork. Now, the, the work was done. It was just funny, you know, it was kind of like, kind of like, uh, yeah. Now, these kids are great, and they're, they're active and social, too. So I, I don't, I'm not criticizing them. But what I'm going to say is, typically our audience is looking for a sound bite. They're looking for a snippet. They're looking for a summary anyway. They don't want, they don't want long-winded, like, hour-long meetings. They want five minutes, get right to the, the heart of it. That's right. So in that sense, uh, just so you know, at our church, we're going to pull, or we're going to call an audible. Typically, what we have done for worship is we have, on the first Sunday of the month, done, done one of the new service settings out of our hymnal. On the second Sunday of the month, we have done an old setting out of the red hymnal that has become very commonplace for us called Service of the Word. On the third Sunday of the month, we've done kind of a hybrid of Service of the Word and Sacrament together with one of the, the new service settings out of the new hymnal. And the fourth Sunday of the month, we do a kind of a, a unique offshoot liturgy that's from one of the supplemental resources from the old red hymnal, and that is called Morning Praise. And we've done Morning Praise now for a long time at our church. 11 years, actually, almost. Well, typically, on Communion Sundays, we confess with the words of the Nicene Creed. But be, and, and the Nicene Creed is awesome. Who wrote it? Remember from Sunday? Who wrote the Nicene Creed? Who? No, not my dad. My dad. Oh, that's correct. St. Athanasius wrote the Nicene Creed. You saw it. Um, but the Nicene Creed is longer. It's not as succinct, and it's a we, not an I. And I'm thinking about our church, our context, our people, and the kind of people that you interact with every day in your Christian life and in your Christian witness. And I want you to be able to back pocket that thing that you say every Sunday. Well, why not say the creed that is shorter and more succinct twice per month rather than once per month, which is what we've done right now because the morning praise liturgy does not have the creed in it. So we could have added it to the morning praise liturgy, but instead what I've done is I've taken the liberty to add uh, to, uh, uh, to switch it up and to do the, night, the Apostles' Creed on each of the communion Sundays because those are, the, those are the longer liturgies anyway. And then you'll get it twice a month. And we're going to do the Nicene Creed on the Service of the Word Sunday because that's the shorter service typically anyway without communion. And we get the Nicene Creed in there. We'll see if there's anything to do on the morning praise Sundays. What I've thought about on the morning praise Sundays so that they're not like 45 minutes to 50 minutes long all the time is maybe more regularly doing a rotation of Luther's explanations to the Apostles' Creed. So, because that would help our catechumens, that would help us a little bit to kind of back pocket some of those things like, I cannot by my own thinking or choosing believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, right? So, just, just some thought, but we, we can play with those kind of things for the benefit of your Christian witness, and we can do so with the help of the creeds and the confessions. In your own words, oh no, we're on the next one. List the three creeds and the six Lutheran confessions. So creeds, apostles, Nicene, Athanasian. Yep, apostles was not written by the apostles. It's just a summary of what the apostles believed and taught. And it is what we call a peaceful or an irenic creed. The Nicene Creed was a, a wartime-ish, and what they mean by that is conflict because it's polemical. The initial author of the Nicene Creed, as we spoke about before, was Athanasius in 325, but it didn't take its final shape until 451 A.D., 1,500 years ago. The Athanasian Creed was also a creed written under duress or conflict, named after Athanasius but not written by Athanasius. He was an awesome, awesome young defender of the faith, but uh, unfortunately the Christian empire sold out to, to um, Arianism and its adherents after that. 
in a big way because it was, they were mixing politics and, and the church. In any case, Athanasian Creed explains and defends the doctrine of the Trinity, probably completed in Spain or France around the 400s AD, though we don't know exactly for sure when. Now, these are not as well known. I can't remember. I think Pastor Crucial might have taught a class in the Confessions here at one point, maybe in 2011-ish, maybe. In any case, it's before I got here because I, I saw the, the resources out in the lot, or maybe Pastor Pieper did during the vacancy. However, the six Lutheran confessions to which we subscri- subscribe are what in order? The Augsburg, that's right, the Augsburg Confession of 1530. Yep. Or uh, I think Sharon's, or uh, Jen made the mention of the unaltered Augsburg Confession. Because unfortunately it was fudged at one point. And we don't believe in the fudging of it. The Apology of the Augsburg Confession is the next one. Probably around the same time, the same year, might have carried over. But whereas the Augsburg Confession was written in a time of peace, it, was, it had a lot of arrows shot at it. And so they wrote the Apology of the Augsburg Confession later to defend what they wrote in the Augsburg Confession. And the Apology was not a, hey guys, we're really sorry about what we wrote the first time. It's actually, uh, hey guys, we staunchly uphold and uh, reiterate what we wrote the first time. Philip Melanchthon wrote both of them. That's how you say that, Melanchthon, Philip Melanchthon. Luther's small catechism of 1529 was the next one written in a time of peace. Author was obviously Martin Luther. Uh, It was written because he essentially did what a circuit pastor is supposed to do and he rode around all the churches in Saxony and he was flabbergasted, appalled at how little of biblical truth any of the priests actually knew, much less the people. And back in those days, you didn't have YouTube and you didn't have uh, mybeautifulsaviorchurch.com where you could check out all the things that are true and biblical and confessional. So instead, Luther said, I need, to, uh, I need to put the Bible's teachings into the hands and hearts and homes of God's people. And so he wrote the small catechism. It was intended for parents. That's right. It was intended for parents to teach their kids. So if and when you have kids or grandkids or you know that we have catechism kids coming through the system here, don't forget always to encourage them that, you know, it's not up to the church primarily to teach you, it's up to your parents, right? Uh, And you know this too, but just to to highlight that even more, the government is God's servant to provide for your body. The, The church is God's servant to provide for your soul. But the home, the home, is that one unique place where God intends to provide for both. The church is not a food pantry. The home typically has some sort of pantry. (laughs) Um, The government is not a good source for, it's not a good uh, well for spirituality or morals, is it? You can see that more and more by the day. But the government does provide for your body in some ways. But the church, uh, excuse me, the church provides for your soul. But the home, you can can get both food and nourishment for body and soul. Okay, after Luther's small catechism, what was next? The large, yep. Notice the dates. The Augsburg Confession of 1530 and the Apology in 1530, but when were the small and large catechisms written? 1529. So Lutheran teaching or Christian, pure Christian doctrine had already begun to be uh, expounded prior to the Augsburg Confession. So that's, that's good. That means the influence was spreading and there was a coagulation of adherence or a gelling. 
Also, please note that um, the small catechism was written in a time of peace, whereas Luther's large catechism was, uh, well, I think I I might have misspoken there. That was, was that a time of, oh, they said it was, well, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we put polemical there, not because it was written during a time of duress necessarily yet, that was coming, but rather because he's much more candid. (laughs) Pardon me. He's much more uh, brazen and candid with his words in the large catechism. He says things that are pretty blunt. And so in that sense, it's, uh, it's polemical. The large catechism, by the way, I've got copies of that if you ever want to borrow and read it. Luther is, uh, you know, he's not, it's not like reading a novel. This is not Clancy, Tom Clancy. This is, uh, it takes a little bit of, you know, clear out your Saturday morning and sit at the coffee table for like three or four hours with your coffee and just take it nice and slow. Yep. Take it nice and slow, nice and slow, steady as she goes. But, uh, but it is incredibly valuable to read it. Uh, I'll just give you one quick example, one quick snippet. From the large catechism, Luther talks about how no matter how dumb, poor, or idiosyncratic your parents are, your job is to love them. And I'll tell you, you know, when you're a teenager, everybody thinks their parents are dumb, poor, idiosyncratic, or not, not cool, right? Not cool. When you're a teenager, your parents are the furthest thing from cool. And that's, I don't know that I ever looked down on my parents in any way that way, but I definitely thought, like, I knew what fun was and I knew what was cool and they didn't. Well, turns out, like usual, I was wrong. My parents were right and now you can see the wisdom of not only your parents but of things like what Luther says here, to regard your parents as next to God because next to God, they are the highest authority. Didn't share the faith with you. But you can still see the the challenge of parenting. And you can still love your parents as God calls you to do under the fourth commandment even though you may not agree with everything about your parents, right? And that's kind of the point of the fourth commandment, to honor your authorities even though you know quite well how imperfect they are. That's that's the challenge of the fourth commandment. Um, Furthermore, the fourth commandment, uh, something you said reminded me, and for those at home, Jen was saying, because I grew up in a Lutheran family, I learned about regarding my parents as next to God, as his authorities, because of my Lutheran upbringing. She never had that. Though you never had that, whether you realize it or not, you had some understanding of that because the, remember, remember the moral law of God, the natural law, is written on our hearts and our consciences. And so you knew that you were supposed to honor and regard your parents even though, like me, you didn't always do it, right? <laughs> Correct. Yep. Honor, serve, and obey them and give them love and respect, Luther says in his explanation. So my point is, though, even if you didn't have that regard, which I did not have that all the time either, uh, my point is that you still were generally aware of it because you had a conscience. So in that sense, you were a little ahead. <clears throat> Jen's, for the record, Jen's father likes the Green Bay Packers, so that means he's probably one of the wisest fathers on planet Earth, next to my dad, of course. (laughs) All right, go Jets, go Jets. Last two confessions before we digress too far. What was the last, second to last? Yep, it's called the small called. It's called the small called of 1537. This is the most polemical. This is the most Luther at, at Luther. This is Luther at his best, in other words. Luther wrote this to help Lutheran princes who had been commanded by the emperor to a diet of small cold. If they're calling it the Augsburg Confession or the Apology of the Augsburg Confession or the small cold articles, that means there was probably some kind of convention or conference or what they used to call a diet in that city of Germany. Okay? Last but not least, who, um, what was the last confession written by Jacob, Andrea, and Martin Chemnitz? 
Chemnitz primarily. The formula of Concord. Yep, Concord. You could say Concord, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit, uh, it's like a mouthful, that's all. It's not wrong to say it that way, it's just a mouthful. Formula of Concord, 1577, and that is polemic as well. Authored by Jacob Andrea Martin Chemnitz in response to increasing attacks on Lutheran doctrine. Clear and very thorough. Formula of Concord is awesome. The one thing you want to remember is that that's the second Martin. Martin Chemnitz as opposed to Martin Luther. Uh, I've got, if you walk through my office, you'll see to the left on my shelf, I've got quite a bit of, of uh, quite a number of books written by Martin Chemnitz because he was a rock. A pillar. Number 15, in your own words, why is God's word so valuable for your faith and life? Okay, good. Without God's word, you wouldn't have faith at all? Yeah. Say again? Okay, gives you guidance. Good. Yeah. Excellent. And that was something he talked about. Comfort. Yeah. is a big one. Um, you guys have all hit the nail on the head. The one thing I'll say is just that I think it was at the end of chapter 4, wasn't it, where he just said that God would even bother that God would even bother to reveal himself to you and me is such a ma majestic miracle of grace that he would even bother to open himself up to reveal himself to people who were so closed off to him, separated from him, despised, rejected, turned away, sinful, and yet he pours himself open. And on the pages of Scripture, for you, because he loves you. All right, what underlying goal does every temptation of Satan have? Deny the faith, yes, turn you away from God, that's true, but think about the chapters we've been in for the last four chapters. What does he want to do? Specifically, what kind of doubt? What are we talking about? The word, yeah. He, Satan's goal is to undermine the word. Think, think, think. Genesis 3, did God really say, did God really say, is that really what he meant? You know, well, God did say this, but the Lord knows he's withholding something from you, Eve. The Lord knows that when you eat of it, you'll know the difference between good and evil. And Eve said, no, oh, no. Rationally, reason, becoming the master, not the servant. Eve says, yeah, I can, I can go along with that. And crash. It all comes tumbling down. All right. Good job on the worksheets, especially given the late hour of my email. Let's go to the key terms. We'll hustle through these and head home. For the sake of time, I'll just go through them and double check your definitions with mine. Malchristen, German word for a mere mouth Christian, that is a hypocrite. Theologia est habitus practicus. Theology is a practical aptitude. God gave us his word for our salvation so that, we know how, so that we know what to believe and how to live and to glorify himself. Transubstantiation. I, I know this was not a, these were not, these terms were not necessarily all focal points of the chapter. I just want you to at least have some general awareness of them all in case you hear them in our Lutheran context. Transubstantiation is the Roman Catholic Church, and we often abbreviate that RCC. So it's the RCC false teaching that a priest, by virtue of his own ordination and personal power as a priest, can transform the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper into the body and blood of Christ, which is a flagrant lie. We'll talk a lot more about the Lord's Supper later. We'll probably repeat this, but they, often, they also say that it is a non-bloody re-sacrifice of Christ on the cross every time they celebrate it. I just went to a Catholic funeral uh, about a month ago and they celebrated the Lord's Supper at that funeral or what they, they did not actually celebrate the Lord's Supper. They thought they did but they did not allow anybody to drink the wine except the priest. It was the, the supper in one kind which is no supper at all. So they, didn't, they think they have the Lord's Supper but they do not have it. And that is 
horrible. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, you think you have the supper, you think you have the Lord's Supper, but you don't. Shall I praise you for this? No, he says. So the, the point of that section of the Bible is there is a wrong way. There is a wrong way. And one of the wrong ways is by regarding the supper in such a way where you think you have it, but you don't. Something less than the full body and blood of Christ. All right. The ministerial use of reason. This is the subservient or the servant role of reason to Scripture. The magisterial use of reason. This is the teaching or practice of elevating reason above the Scripture. the teaching or practice of elevating reason above Scripture. Sola Scriptura simply means by Scripture alone. By Scripture alone. All we believe, teach, and confess is rooted only in the Bible. Now, I put credo or creed in the same line there, and that's because credo is the Latin term that simply means I believe. But a creed is a statement of what we believe and teach and confess from the Bible. So credo or credo means I believe. Creed means it's not just a bad, uh, too often played band from the radio. Creed is a statement of what we believe, teach, and that's what you thought it was, right, Jen? A creed is a statement of what we believe, teach, and confess from the Bible. If you're not catching my bad uh, social reference or cultural reference, creed is the name of a very famous and overplayed rock band from back in the day. From back in the day. They have a very deep, they have a, like Eddie Vedder kind of sound to them. Yeah. Okay. Norma normata is the guided norm of pure doctrine. That is the creeds and the confessions. Okay? The guided norm. It's what's it's kind of like what's on the leash. It's it's the pup. I wonder what they mean by that. Secondary confession. I'll have to look that up. Okay. I don't know. Could be. It could also mean that the maybe they're saying the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, and that the Athanasian are primary. And that the Lutheran confessions of the medieval ages are what are secondary. I don't know. But I'll look into that a little bit. Yeah, the, so the norma normata means the ruled rule or the guided norm of pure doctrine. That is the creeds and confessions. The norma normans, is how you say that, is the guiding rule or the ruling rule of pure doctrine. The guiding norm. That is the Bible. Now again, you're not going to remember these. These will leave your head as fast as they went into it. But it's good to just have a general awareness in case in, like maybe you come to a pastor's conference and you sit in on a, on a session or you have a Bible study at LWMS or uh, we, make, we make a citation of it in a sermon. Again, or uh, even maybe we'd study the confession sometime this upcoming year. Whatever it is, if you hear some of this terminology, at least you'll, you'll have heard of it before and you can dust off the cobwebs later. Okay, okay. I, I had a typo or a uh, misprint on your worksheets where I put the word quatinus in there out of order and, and I put it in there twice, I think. It should only be in there once, but let's go to the quatinus term now. Quatinus is a Latin word meaning insofar as. And it is demonic as it pertains to um, those who subscribe to the creeds and confessions only insofar as their doctrines draw from the Bible, not because they derive their doctrines from the Bible. So the term quatinus refers to erring Christians and false teachers who subscribe to the creeds and confessions only insofar as their doctrines draw from the Bible. So the Latin term itself, quatinus, means insofar as. Whereas quia, and that's what we are, is a Latin word meaning because. It refers to us. We subscribe to the creeds and the confessions not because they are the scripture, 
but because their teachings are drawn exclusively from the Scriptures. Okay? You got that one too, Jim? Okay. We've already talked about this, so we'll hustle. Irenic comes from a Greek word meaning peaceful. And we use it to refer to a type of creed written in a time of peace. Polemical is from a Greek word meaning war. It's a type of creed written under doctrinal duress or conflict. Apology comes from a Greek word meaning defense. So we use it to refer to, of course, the apology to the Augsburg Confession, the creedal document written to defend the faith. You might have heard a little bit of a uh, rejuvenation or like a, what do you call it, like a, a renaissance use of that term. Like it's, it's coming back into vogue again because one of the big topics out there, if you go searching in Christian bookstores or if you even go through like the seminary website or the Wells Forward in Christ, there's more and more articles that deal with what are called apologetics how to help you as a Christian defend your faith. Okay? It's called apologetics. We even have a seminary professor who, along with evangelism, is basically called to be an apologetics professor now. And he's, by the way, he's written a very good book that's available on NPH. I don't think I've purchased it yet. I'll have to look and see. But uh, he's a former baseball player with me at MLC. His name is Sam Degner. Very, very gifted pastor and writer. And uh, I'd highly recommend his book. Philip Melanchthon was the author of the Unaltered Augsburg Confession and the Apology. Martin Luther was the author of the Small Catechism, the Large Catechism, and the Small Called Articles. He also wrote a tremendous amount more, a whole compendium called Luther's Works. I've got it all digitally. I'll study them in snippets with, uh, for sermon prep sometimes. But he's, uh, like he'll, he'll take Genesis, for example, and he'll write um, 20 pages on one verse. I mean, he's, he had no distractions back then, no cell phones. So. Martin Chemnitz. Martin Chemnitz is a guy who wrote, uh, it, well, he was one of the prominent co-authors of the Formula of Concord. He's the Reformation's second Martin. He's also the one who is famous for having said ad fontes, which means back to the source. In other words, go back to the Bible. You could learn something from him when you talk to people about the faith. Just put in your back pocket a real delicate way to say, what's the Bible say? Or, huh, have, have you read about that in the Bible? Or, Oh, interesting. I wonder if the Bible says anything about that. You know, you got to figure out a way to not say it disparagingly or condescendingly or confrontationally. Or maybe there's a case where you will, you say it that way. But uh, when in doubt, back to the source, like Chemnitz said. Finally, the last term is filioque. Filioque is how you say that. That's a Latin term meaning and the son, capital S O N. Okay, that was in the book towards the end of the chapter of four. Filioque, it was, it was in the context of the uh, Nicene Creed. It was added to the third article of the Nicene Creed to make it clear that we believe the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. And at one point, the Creed lacked that little phrase, and the Son. And so the Christians held fast to say, no, no, no. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. Okay? Any questions or comments on Lesson 5, Chapter 4? If not, look for a worksheet for Chapter 5. Tomorrow, can someone double-check the schedule for me? Do we meet again next Monday? The 19th, so today is the 12th. We will meet again next week on Monday the 19th. Uh, I think we're going to I think we're gonna have a good number of classes in a row here now. And then we'll take off more at the end of July and in August, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. No problem. Do we have that on the schedule? Uh, I know. You guys might be gone too. We'll see. We can always, uh, the other thing we could do is on a given week, we could also meet on a different night depending on schedules. So if we wanted to meet, for example, that week on a Wednesday night instead of Monday, we can do that and make that announcement. We'll just talk about it the week before. With that said, let's close with the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.